Hey guys, uh, good afternoon. Am I audible here? All right, guys. Okay, so we'll get started now. One moment. Let me share my screen here. Okay, all right. Okay, guys. So we are going to continue off from where we left off yesterday. So yesterday we kind of talked about what is data science, machine learning, and then we kind of also mentioned a little bit about Python. Okay, so Python is a programming language that is kind of absolute favorite of data scientists, if you ask me. And it is one of the most widely used languages right now in the field of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science. Okay, so today we are going to kind of understand a few things, few important things about how to understand about pattern recognition and uh, I will show you a few use cases or I will try to make you understand like how we can really utilize them for our use case as well. Okay. Now guys, again, I'm very clear that it won't, all of this would not make sense. First of all, I'm very, very clear about this. Okay. Because maybe if you do not know Python or something, uh, I'm not sure that all the programming will make sense to you immediately. Okay. So, is gonna is gonna have issues. So don't worry, try to understand the intuition here. Okay. Try to understand the intuition here. That would be more important rather than trying to understand all the code. Because again, uh, not everyone will be able to connect with these ideas. Okay, so let's let's have a look and try to understand what we need to learn here. So one of the things that I think we should definitely look is something we like to call pattern. So if I ask any one of you, like, what is a pattern? Could you tell me? You can also write down your answers in the chat. I, I will read it out. So guys, what is a pattern? Mm, diagram. Okay, some people say a series of events. Okay, let me, let me try this. Okay. So let's say I write one, two, three, four, five. Guys, what comes after this? Now after five, what, what comes after five? Six, right? You, you will say six and you will not be really wrong. Perfect. If I were to ask you this question, one, two, three, and then what comes after this? Okay, people say four, four, five, six. Okay, now, but if I were to, If I were to put just some extra values, extra points here. Now, what comes after this? Yes, five. Now, as you can understand, it's a Fibonacci series, right? Where the current number, the current one is basically the sum of the previous two numbers. So guys, how were you able to detect or predict what is gonna come next? Any idea? It's 10. Any idea? How exactly? But what is it? Concepts, yeah. Or maybe someone figured out the mathematical function. Out of the three, leave the first one and then add the last one, we'll get the next number. Yeah, that, that's fine, that's fine. But generality is what? What is the generality here? What you guys did is, if if I'm, if I'm aim, you guys understood the series or the sequence, or I would say the word pattern. You understood the pattern, okay? So basically what you figured out, there seems to be a mathematical function. So for the n nth number, basically nth number is nothing but n minus one plus, and minus two number, right? So this is called a pattern. Now, pattern in patterns are available everywhere. Now, guys, if I were to ask you a simple question, what would be good examples of pattern? Okay, what would be good examples of pattern? Any uh, in real world, what examples you could think about a pattern? A daily sun rising in the east. And then disappearing in the west in the evening. Hmm. Okay. Okay. That is one good example. Anything else? 
Kaleidoscope, yes, yes. Kaleidoscope is a very good example. Our bodily functions, yes, they, they can also follow a pattern. Maybe someone can also make an argument about, let's say, there is, is there a pattern? Okay, try to establish or try to tell me. As, let's say, as your numbers of experience, so let's say you work in an industry and let's say your years of experience is increasing. What happens to your salary ideally? As years of experience increases, what happens to your salary? Ideally, one could say, now there are variations. I'm not saying it is perfect or something. But ideally, one could say the salary usually increases. Would I be right? As your years of experience increases in your domain or your, uh, how do I say, company, what happens in long term? You will see salaries of people do keep on increasing. Is that a correct thought? Yes, supposedly. I'm not saying it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect relationship here. There is gonna be some kind of a okay. There is gonna be some kind of variation. There is gonna be some kind of a randomness in between of them. Okay, I agree with that. It's not a perfect relationship at any moment. But a generality is that as your numbers of years of experience increases, your salary also goes up. Very good. So this is called, this is something we like to call, the correct word is called correlation. Between two numerical variables, let's say X and Y, we could figure out correlation. And correlation is kind of like indication of the linear strength of connectivity or relationship. How X and Y are connected to each other, okay. So someone could describe X is equal to rho. And this rho is nothing but Pearson correlation coefficient. Now, don't worry uh, if you do not know all this. It's not, a, it's not an issue, okay? But this rho kind of indicates the strength or amount of the strength and the direction, okay? In, in what direction they are kind of associated with each other. So like one example I could give you is what happens when the temperature increases? What happens to sales of cooler? So cooler or AC, uh, let's say sales. Okay, so this is a temperature increase. Okay? This is your temperature increase and this is your sales of cooler or AC. Or not cooler, AC. So guys, what would be a generic idea again? Okay. As the temperature is increasing, let's say, yes, ideally you will rightfully be like, as the temperature will increase, the sale of AC and cooler will definitely kind of go up, right? Not a perfect relationship, but this is a trend that we observe in these seasons. And similarly, like right now, rainfall is increasing, right? Like rainfall is happening all across India, right? So as the rainfall is increasing, you can argue the same about sales of umbrellas and maybe rain bear, right? That rain, those sales are going up. So now these things are extremely important or these things, the way they work, you have to think very carefully about these things. That if there is inherent relationship, if there is an inherent relationship here in this direction, does it also mean, can we predict something in future? Let me give you an example and let's see if we are able to come up with the intuition. Let's think about a scenario. Let's say you launch a website, okay? Let's say you launch a new website. Let's say it is a matter of e-commerce, okay? And you launch a new website. So what happens initially is that you launch a website and a number of users. So this is, let's say, number of users per minute, okay? Number of users per minute on the website. So initially, this website visits are really low, okay? But you put money in digital marketing, social media promotions, SEO optimization, and all that. And then you slowly start to see there seems to be some kind of a rising effect 
Now the problem is initially you have taken some very cheap servers, okay, to host all these services online, okay. So let's say your engineer comes and tells you one day that, so your engineering team tells you this, that, look, sir, right now the server capacity that we have would be able to only handle close to 60,000 users per minute, okay? Not more than that. If that happens, if we cross that limit, the whole system will crash, okay? Now, what we can do is we can put some kind of pre-bid on the servers. We can preempt some servers and put some pre-bid and we could try to get some servers in cheap, but only if I know how much and what time I'm gonna reach. So let me just show you that the way, let's say it is increasing. So imagine this is n is equal to 10 day. Okay, so th these are days, okay, number of days. Maybe this is n is equal to 20. So around 20, I could say, our user base has increased and it has touched around 27,000 users per minute, okay. And you know this uh, threshold is 60,000 users. Now, of course, someone can say it can happen tomorrow. It, can, it might not even happen in a year or something, right? That's okay. But if we are supposedly gonna follow in this trend and once these things take off, they start usually following some kind of exponential pattern, okay? So it means they move fast, okay? They grow or the growth is really fast. Like a compounding interest scenario, okay? So now what is gonna happen is, let's say if I were to come at n is equal to 30, and if I were to come and figure this one out, so basically, could you tell us or could my engineering team tell us well in advance that by what time approximately we will require a new server on addition on top of the existing one so that our system does not stop or crashes altogether. So do you see if we could figure out the right pattern, we would be able to predict what's going to happen or when it's going to happen. Approximately, again, I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but could you see that pattern happening here? That if someone could figure out the right function here, then in future, uh, we could come and tell like around which number of day we would be re reaching around number 60 or 60,000 uh, users per minute on our website. And we would be trying to preempt or we would be trying to put some server or compute power well in advance. Does this idea make sense? Guys, if you have any doubt, go ahead and ask. Okay, so basically, look, Ruthik, what I'm trying to say here is, see, if you could figure out a function which corresponds the number of days and number of users, like it would be like number of users, if I were to say, because the site is growing, let's say, can I say number of users or user number is kind of a function of how many days you have spent in market? Maybe let's say, let's imagine the function is x squared, okay? Users, number of users is nothing but x squared or number of days squared, okay? As many days, every day, the amount kind of like is squaring up, okay? So it is going exponential after a while. Okay, so it's gonna like move like really, really fast. Okay, so if I were to come with this idea, then we will be able to figure this part out, right? Would you, would you believe in this? So when we say the word pattern recognition, what do we mean by this?
the overall idea of machine learning, just understanding the pattern or figuring out the pattern. The fundamental idea of machine learning is all brought around this idea of pattern recognition. Okay, that if you cannot do the right pattern recognition, you will not be able to do or kind of work with machine learning. See, you could have a numerical regression problem. Okay, we can have a numerical regression where again, we could have this house, okay, square footage, square foot footage means area, okay, square footage is the area of the house. And this could be a price, okay? This would be less a price. So what do you think would be the average scenario or what would be the generic idea? So what kind of correlation one could think that let's say we have a, some square footage. Let's say this is about a home of, let's say, 1400 square foot. So if you could figure out the function would you be able to predict in the same complex how much a 1600 square foot home is going to cost me? Yeah, guys, anyone? Yeah, based on square feet or square meters, whatever, whatever you want to utilize, that's okay with me. But now you guys can very easily figure this part out is as maybe the pricing is increasing or the way the price goes ahead, we could immediately figure it out that the price is going up. And of course, there is, seems to be a direct correlation, of course. Okay. So as the price goes up, We need to figure out for 1600 square feet or maybe 1800 square feet, we should be able to tell or approximate the price very easily. Right. So here you can say price, price of the home is nothing but a function of area, area of the home. And of course, you one can make a case that we could have multiple parameters. And yes, I will agree with this that. It's just not the square footage. It's just not the square footage of the overall property that really, that that really really matters at the end of the day. Okay. But just if I wanted to do analysis based on square footage itself, we could do that. And here again, the overall idea is very simple. We are trying to figure out the function of x or you can say function based on the square footage or the area itself. Does this point make sense? First of all, till this point is everyone clear? Okay, very good. Okay. So when we talk about function, and it's just not the regression, that was a regression example where we were trying to predict the numerical outcome. Here, we could have a different scenario as well. Maybe someone wants to do classification, wants to segregate two classes properly. Okay. What can we do here? Again, maybe the task would be to come up with a function or figure out a right function, which would be able to segregate these two classes. So, okay, we will get a proper segregation. So maybe not a perfect one, but let's see. Okay. So we might be able to get a proper segregation in this scenario. Okay, again, this, this thing that you're observing is still a function of x, okay, still a function of x. Of course, we can design it in the way that we want to make it work. 
that, that's totally up to us. Okay. Yeah, line, line, or it could be a curve. Yes, one could always think about that. Okay, maybe I will come up with a line. Okay, that's also okay. Or you can come up with that curve that or the gray curve that we have built over there. Okay. Well, so guys, this is the simplest idea or the in a simplest way I could explain you why pattern recognition is so important. Okay. That without pattern recognition, we will not be able to make prediction in our data sets. And without prediction, machine learning is of no use to us. So if I were to ask you a simple question, could you think about a use case where we are doing this or where you might be doing this, but you might not even be realizing that at the end of the day, fundamentally we are just running pattern information behind the scenes. No, I'm just simply asking you a question that could you think about a way or could you think about a process where we would get or we are running pattern information behind the scenes, but we don't even know it. Okay. Employees attendance. Yes, attendance. Okay. Performance management. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe I will say one good example is employee attrition. Do you understand what employee attrition means? Yeah. Number of people leaving the organization at yeah. different levels. Yes. At different levels, people that are quitting or leaving your organization per year. That can be mentioned as employee attrition. Okay, maybe there could be another scenario that could be useful for us and that we could like to think about, okay. Maybe we can think about, uh, let's say uh, there are tumors, right? So, sir? yeah, go ahead, please. Sir, can you repeat again, sir? Uh, it's still confusing. So, so can you repeat once again? Which part? Uh, this uh, upper pattern recognition part, sir. Sorry, which one? Pattern recognition part, sir. Sorry, I cannot hear you. What, what did you just say? Which one? Employee attrition? Pattern, pattern recognition. Uh, okay, Rupik, uh, can I say it like this? See, in this whole session, you will not understand pattern recognition anyway. I will be happy to repeat, but please understand. It's yes, a much sir. complicated idea. Like I am trying to just simplify things out. Okay? So see, Rupik, the overall idea is very simple. That we are saying that the data distribution is governed by some pattern. Okay. When I say pattern, what you guys should think is, okay, let me maybe give it an idea. When I say the word pattern, you guys think mathematical function. Can you do this? Whenever I say pattern, in your head, it should it immediately get replaced by this idea, which should say mathematical function. Yes, sir. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is most of machine learning is mathematical function approximation or pattern recognition, okay? Now I give few examples that like that website example, right? I am simply saying the growth of a website, mm -hmm. once it takes off, happens practically in an exponential manner, okay? So exponential is a function, right? Do you know what is exponential? Yes, sir. Increase of function. It's like- Square, e power. power. E no, no, power that is, yeah, e to the power x is the exponential. E to the power x goes something like this, okay? You have to understand it like this at zero, e is basically one. It practically takes off like this. Okay. 
So what I'm trying to say is there is a function behind the scenes and our task is to recognize it or figure it out or approximate it out. In machine learning, that's majority of the task. Is that is that part of it? Okay. All right. Now, upfront is very hard to know which function we are using and how we are using. So, but we do have some generic rules how machine learning inherently works. Okay. So, let me show you how we can make this work and what would be the scenario and what would be the utility here. So, I was saying, like, let's say, based on uh, Okay, we can we can give some idea. So let's say based on the size and maybe friendliness. Okay. Maybe based on the size and the friendliness, let's try to decide. So guys, let's talk about dogs and cats. Okay. Okay, guys, on an average between dog and cat, which one is scoring higher on the size factor? Come on, dogs or cats? Ideally, which one is a bigger, bigger species or bigger animal? Dogs, yes, very good. So it, would it be okay if I were to put on dogs, the size would be high. And even in terms of friendliness, what do we notice about dogs and cats? Who are more friendly to us? Like, again, in general, I'm of course saying this part. Okay, dogs are more friendly. Okay, <laughs> let's see. So can I plot dogs like this? I could score them higher. I could score them pretty much higher in the size and friendliness factor. And then I could try to score cats on the lower side. Why? Because they are smaller in the size. And maybe, maybe they are just tiny bit less friendly, less playful to us. So to differentiate them, maybe someone can come and say, you know what, what we could do is we could figure out a small function for now. Okay, maybe we could figure out a function in between of them, which could give us a very good idea. Okay, one minute, let me just draw this properly. Hmm. And this function behaves like a separator. So now let me ask you a simple question. If this is a separator, then this point belongs to dogs. This point is a dog or a cat. And of course, you could have exceptions. I'm not denying that all cats are bad or something like that. So not bad, are less friendly. But see, in generality, we are talking, of course, there would be some points which would be like a crossover scenario or something. But just based on the basic idea that we have right away. So what about this? This belongs to dogs or cats? It looks like dogs, right? Because on this side of the line of the hyperplane that we have right now, this is the class which is dedicated to dogs, okay, or this area. And this area is dedicated to cats. Again, without sure. function estimation, this is not going to work out, is it? Where are they? Go ahead. 
which uh, then what is the intermediate point sir between dogs and cats sorry where is the intermediate point uh, the friendly line, the between dog and cats uh, this this intermediate point will be available sir in this graph sorry i am not getting which is the intermediate according to you yes, sir are you mentioning about this point or I, this yes sir these are misclassification the line sir i the line that is intermediate point or uh, it's a uh, but Inter i do not see any point which is on the center of the line which point are you observing oh, okay so okay sir okay i do not see any one of them right now so yes oh okay so if you are saying if there were a point which was exactly on the line what would that even mean right yes sir yes sir yes so that's like a 50 50 scenario it could go either ways that's like a 50 50 scenario and it could go either ways Although there are ways to mitigate it by using some kind of a threshold or some kind of probability value, but yes, theoretically that will mean it is literally it's kind of a, in between of both of them, and randomly we might have to assign it. So these are perfect examples of where misclassification might happen. Miss, what I'm trying to say is maybe the dog is getting based on just these properties. Maybe the dog is gonna get misclassified as a cat, and maybe the cat will get misclassified as a dog. Does this idea make sense? Okay, very good. So if someone had to decide or if someone had to say no, okay, fine, let's say, how do we even do this, right? What would be the process? Now guys, of course I cannot take a very deep dive in machine learning because we just don't have that much time today. But I would like to take a very simple approach to explain you a one sample problem, which might make sense, which might in, ignite your curiosity, and maybe that, that gives you the right motivation. Okay, so let's just move this out. And... And again, I will I will uh, take this house house price prediction. Simple example, but makes a lot of sense. Okay. So again, let's say if some data points are given to you. Okay, some data points are given to you, and these data points are now these are supervised example. What it means is, what are the features of the home? So one feature could be said. One feature of the home is the area, square foot or carpet area. You can see. And the y is the price over here, right? So wherever the outcome or the price is the outcome here is given, these kind of examples are called supervised. So in supervised example, what's going to happen inherently? We will have, so let's say someone will mention that the square footage of the flat is 1280 square foot. And someone would come and say, let's mention the price here as well. And we will say, it is, let's say, Bangalore would be like what? 68 lakhs okay 68 lakhs so you can in indian rupees you can write it like this okay so the idea is if i have multiple data points around describing various flats and let's say there could be another flat of 1050 and that flat cost us like let's say 51 okay 51 i will just write 68 51 i will not try to write all the zeros here so guys, if I ask you, okay, there is a new flat in the market where it's in the similar region or similar area. Uh, uh, sorry, similar area means similar locality, not the surface area. And the, the surface area of this flat is a little different, less than 19, 1956 square feet. Okay. So guys, could you tell me what would be the price of these things? No, for 1956 square feet, what should be the pricing? Right, people are making guessworks, but I would say, okay, just think about this. Let's plot them. Let's plot them on our chart here and try to see what, what we can get. So let's say for 1050, you are getting, this is less than 1050 square feet you have something called 51 right at some point yeah 51 okay let's say this is a 51 and for 1280 square feet this is 1280 uh, something like 68 lakhs is there right i know this is not up to scale and everything 
So if there are only two points, actually it makes sense. I could argue here that it actually makes sense to come up with a simple solution. Come up with a line, come up with this line, and then this becomes a function. And what would be the equation of this line? I could simply say the price, price function is nothing but some parameter. Okay, let's say M, okay, M into area plus some coefficients or constant, okay, constant value. Okay, so if I could figure out this M and constant, M and constant, so then I can literally put the value of 19,156 square footage and I will be able to extrapolate what would be the price of that, that building or yeah, that uh, property. Think about it guys. Did this idea just make sense or are you, are you not clear? Yeah, good. Now, let me make the problem a little more complicated for you, little more. Now here you could draw a very easy straight line. So there was no trouble, everyone got the right answer. Okay, but the trouble is in real world, there is a lot of fluctuation. See, as we know, it's just not the area that is defining everything, okay. So let's say this is the this is the kind of data right now we have about our properties and our prices around them. Okay. Okay. Now one could come up and say, one could come up and say that inherently there seems to be like a linear connectivity here, if I if I may say so. So again, guys, this is area and this is the price. Okay. So now let's try to make a prediction happen here. Okay. Let's try to make a prediction happen. So guys, how will the prediction work here? See, uh, now what is, what is the problem here? Now you will see there is no one straight line you will be able to come up with. Because there is inherent randomness in data. It's very hard to figure out one proper straight line which will work in all the scenarios, right? So one could come up and simply say this, that you know what, rather than trying to find that part out, let me just draw these things again. Why don't I do something different? Can I try to find an approximate line, okay, or something like which works for most of the points or the best fit line, let's call it a best fit line. Are you guys getting this? Um, how would we get this best fit line or best fit representation of this data? Okay, let me give you an idea. Now guys, understand, this is a non-deterministic scenario. So there would be never be a perfect solution. What we want to work on is, is a solution which works for most of the cases, most of the cases, okay? So there is never gonna be a perfect solution. So what about I say this, that if I want to figure out the best line or best hyperplane or curve, whatever it is, let's stick with best hyperplane for now though, okay? It should have the minimal error or minimum distance from the all the points. So 
some kind of an error or some cost, total cost function that I would like to take. So I could say whatever the line is, okay, let me let me write it like this. The overall line and minus the actual can be minimized the whole thing. Why this minimization is required? Okay, consider another line. One moment. Hmm. If I were to come up with this line, would this line be a good fit? The purple one that I just made here. Okay, guys, just tell me, is the red line making a better description of the data or the purple one? Red one, of course, right? If you have to define it numerically, how do you even define it? Closer to the point. So this is the gap or this is the minimization I want you to think about. Okay. So the generic idea is you start with a random value. Okay. So you imagine there is this line or hyperplane. Okay. And you say y hat means predicted. Okay. It means the predicted outcome. And uh, y hat would be, let's say, a function of theta 1 into x plus theta naught. Okay. Now, what is x here? Okay. Let me just specify this very clearly. So, x is what exactly? Square footage. Okay. Now this is one parameter, parameter one, and you can also call it parameter two. So guys, what are the unknowns here? So someone can say, okay, we do not know theta one and what are the theta naught. So I could say, why not you start randomly? Just take random values. Okay, just take random values. Random value, theta one into x, that is the area, plus some random value, theta naught. That is the another, another parameter. Okay. Now, initially, of course, we'll be wrong. Okay. Initially, of course, we are going to be wrong. No doubt about it. So maybe the points are all here. And maybe you, you start with this line. Just imagine. Maybe you start with this kind of line. Now, how do we correct this or how do we bring it to the right place? So what needs to be corrected here? Any idea? So this function is, as you might have understood, is y is equal to theta 1 x plus theta naught. Now the thing is, x and y are actually given to us, right? x and y are given to us in the data itself.
So theta one and theta naught are the unknowns here that we do not know. And let's say we started with random values. Now, does this orange line make any sense with the data? Do you think it is the best representative or is it even close enough? Minimum length between line and point, but this minimum length in some borders. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. No, no one has to be exact here. I just want you guys to have the intuition to do it. Okay? You don't have to be exactly, exactly in that position itself. Okay, so the trick here is, trick here is, alter, uh, iteratively what we need to do here is, the theta value needs to be changed, okay? The theta value that you start with, let's say you start with the random one, needs to be changed or altered, but how do we get this? Now, the distance metric is usually taken, the distance metric is usually taken as, loss function okay they we call it a loss function a loss function can be represented by j of theta because again theta are the variables here. now it is taken as mean squared error so y hat is the predicted one actual y is y is original one okay y hat is the predicted one y is the original data okay Okay, now guys, this kind of function will come up with like some kind of a parabolic shape. Now, let's say we started randomly from here. Okay, we started randomly from here. Let's say this is your random initialization of theta one. Let's say it is 11.9. And guys, understand this is the j theta, okay? j of theta, loss function, okay? Now the idea is we want to minimize j theta, minimize the loss function. Why is this important? Come on, guys. Why minimization of j theta or the loss function is so important here? See, if we do not minimize the j theta or the loss function, then we are in true trouble, right? Because if the loss value is really, really high, okay, it means the line or the hyperplane that you are trying to derive is really far away from the points, okay? And that's, that's the problem for us. Okay, so we as we will reduce the loss, the line would start to come as close or as become the best representative if you ask me. Okay, now for that loss needs to reduce. So let's say you start with some theta value 11.9, theta one. And if I say theta one is equal to, the optimal value is let's say some 5.7. How do I reach from 11.9? How, I, how do I reach, mathematically, again, not intuitively, how do I reach from 11.9 all the way? All the way towards this minima. This is called minima in mathematics. Okay, so how do we reach towards the minimal value? So in mathematics, we have a trick, okay? This is called slope, okay? Why a slope, we can get the direction. Now, how slope is calculated? Does anyone know this? Slope is tan theta. So the slope is basically inherently giving us directions here. 
Slope is tan theta. Now for a continuous function, how we will we can figure it out is very easy actually. You take derivative or differentiation. So a partial derivation of j theta with respect to lesser theta one. Okay. Now this derivative is gonna give you what? Yes, and that getting that angle exactly. This slope that you are getting is basically nothing but in mathematics, this is just the differentiation or the derivative that we get. So could I say that in some kind of a looping scenario, loop will be like where we will kind of continuously keep moving. Okay, in some kind of a looping scenario, what we would like to do here is, we'll need to keep updating our theta values, theta is equal to theta i, whatever the previous theta was in the previous loop, minus the derivative, okay? So j theta, j theta is your loss function, okay? With respect to theta one. And if you keep doing it, at some point, you will reach towards the minimal, minimal error. And then stop. At minimal error, we have to go ahead and stop. So this technique is called, okay? This technique is called gradient descent. Gradient descent. Why? Because see, we are using a gradient. Derivatives are also called gradients, okay? And using them, we are doing descent. Descent means going downwards. Now, why do we want to go downwards? because we want to reduce the loss function. Okay, our loss value. This is a g theta, right? And this is a theta value. So with respect to theta, you want to find that direction where j theta would be the minimalist possible. Okay, and we want to go descent. Like descent means going downwards. So going down this hill, I'm gonna find the lowest error, hopefully. And that lowest error is where on those theta values, on those theta values, Ours will be the best fit line or best fit curve. Does this idea make sense, first of all? Okay. Now, how to code it? Now, guys, I understand most of you do not, might not know Python, so please do not worry about the coding part. I'm just going to show you some visualizations and uh, we'll try to keep it simple for you, okay? So do not worry about the code, but yes, there is coding here, unfortunately. So the thing is, uh, these things can be understood and coded very well if we wanted to do it ourselves as well. So we can code it very well and we could kind of explain this uh, through code as well. Okay, so let me just take a couple of examples and hopefully that makes sense to everyone, okay? So actually, you know what, I'm going to run this. So guys, this platform is called Google Colab, okay? Uh, some of you might have used it. If some of you have not, no worries. It's like a Jupyter Notebook, which runs on Google's infrastructure, okay? So your browser is just required to connect to Google infrastructure. Your code and all the computation, again, happens just on the uh, backend, uh, of the Google backend, not on your computer, okay? I personally like, uh, personally enjoy to use this one. So guys, one thing I'm gonna do is, I will tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create a synthetic data just to demonstrate things. Now this synthetic data will have like y is equal to 40 into x plus, I will put some noise intentionally, okay? So I'm creating this data on my own and this is the noise factor, okay? So do not worry how, uh, if you do not understand the code, please don't worry about this, okay? So we will take some data, we'll simulate some data. Uh, the Jupyter Notebook should usually be installed on your computer, yes, but Colab will work on Google's infrastructure. So I will take this data. So data X is nothing but equal space data from minus 10, minus 10, all the way to 10 and 100 points, 100 search points.
Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this data here. I'm going to create this data here. And this data is something that we will utilize to train our model at some point. So the fitting of the curve or the figuring out of the curve is we like to call as fit or training the model. Okay. Now guys, there are different kinds of tests to figure out linearity. Right now, I will not be going through these things. But we do have tests which can figure out if there is a linear relationship between data. And then it makes sense to run a linear test around them. Okay. So that's okay. We do not have to do everything here because not, not all of this is essential for you. And ideally, in machine learning, we have to separate the data. This is like very important. Okay. So the separation of training testing is important. So training is required to fit the data, but the testing portion is required to test the data, like showing it unknown scenario, right? And in these unknown scenarios, we want to test our data, all right? So this is something that is something that ideally we should do, uh, okay. Okay, guys, so data will, looks like right now, this is how our data looks like. Now guys, what do you notice? What kind of correlation is there? This is a X, okay? This is X and this is a Y, okay? So does it looks like a linear system would be a great fit here? Pretty close to linear, right? Again, there are no, there are gonna be no scenarios where it's gonna be perfect linear relationship. Never, never, it will never happen. But one could very easily make this assumption or see this that maybe we could come up with a linear system which could best represent the data. There would be some errors. We will not be able to minimize all the errors. Not possible. Okay, not possible but we'll be able to minimize those errors as much as possible. That's, that's the plan actually. So I'm gonna use our knowledge about gradient descent. Okay, I'm gonna use this knowledge about gradient descent. I just need to change one or two things. And would like to run this. So what we are really doing here is in this function, I first initialize this idea that y is nothing but like theta one x plus one not x plus theta naught into one. Actually, I'm putting an extra column called one. Okay. Okay. And then basically getting the error, and this is called mean squared error and then getting the gradient, okay? So do not worry if you do not know the mass of the gradient here, okay? But uh, don't worry about that part. Okay, uh, and once we get the gradient, we return it using the function to the next function that is gonna use all this. And then what we do here is, first, we start with a random initialization of the data. Okay, random initialization of the theta parameters or uh, we just like to call it parameters actually. And then we print out the initial weights. Then we pass the training data that we have segregated initially. Okay. And uh, initially the random weights or random parameters are just passed. And then what really happens is we start updating these things. Okay. We start updating these things. Okay. Every step, every iteration, as you can clearly see, this is getting updated. And the idea is as we are able to minimize the error, we are able to come up with a scenario where we get very less error and at some point, it just becomes way, way too small. So as you would go down here, it would become way, way too less. Okay. And at some point, because the changes would be so small, it would not even matter. So if it is, let's say, let's say less than 10 to power minus three, we would like to stop the algorithm completely, okay? But till that does not happen, at every 10th iteration, we are gonna keep printing our iteration and error value. And then whatever the theta value we have right now.
and then we need to increase the iteration number so that we can keep a counter and then the weights the new weights become the old weights or parameters for the next iteration and thus we keep doing this till we find a minimal point where it kind of stops it goes ahead and it kind of stops almost zero it yeah very close to zero pretty zero you can say this so you can see we start with the wrong uh, wrong values or random values and error means quite error is very high but the simple rule is you can see this that the error keeps coming down as the process or the time begins or time keeps on going the error keeps coming down and if error keeps coming down it means we are going in the right direction and at some point it stops and we are able to get our final outcome okay we are able to get our final outcome and maybe i should change the outcome here and let me show you what would be the final equation will look like the final equation that has been estimated by us would look something like this okay and uh, and uh, guys can you see okay so i have tried to represent Try to represent the, all the training data from blue points, the testing data from the red points. And there is a green line. I'm not sure you can see this. But does that green line make sense or does it look like it has fit very well over there? Yes. And the coefficients actually are also called weights in uh, different books. And later you can actually print them out and you could figure out what were the weights that we got after the training. Okay, I know I'm taking a very upper level approach, very high level approach, because again, without explaining all the maths, and it takes time guys, explaining all these things from scratch will take a couple of hours minimum, that much I can tell you right, right now. So I cannot rush this one, and this is why I'm taking a very simplistic approach to explain to you all these ideas. That will make sense, hopefully, and would be easy to understand for everyone. And the good news here is that we can actually develop this same intuition for nonlinear data as well. So I'm just changing some function here. So the data or the function has become like this. This function is gonna behave like right now, like this. It function will be having a sign of x and then some x squared and that and some noise value. Okay, sine plus x squared plus some noise value. That's all. That's all it needs to do. Okay, now this is going to appear like a very nonlinear data. Okay, and let me show you how this data looks like. And you will clearly see this that maybe a line would not be the best way to represent this data. Let me run this real fast. And again, a lot of other steps are going to be very similar separation of data and all of that steps will be similar. So this data set will look, or this data now will look very different to you. It will look like a W, if you observe very carefully. Now this symbol, as you can very clearly see, this W is nothing but. Okay. It's nothing but a nonlinear system or nonlinear function. Okay. Now, we will have to make some minor adjustments to our algorithms. So we'll change the hypothesis, we'll change the gradient formula and uh, just some minor tinkerings is good enough. 
And in the training loop, we will not have to change practically anything. Okay, it will run as it is without any problem. And you can see it takes more amount of training loops, no doubt about it. But you will see the same pattern that error keeps coming down. Okay, as more and more steps will pass over, the error will keep coming down. And the final equation will look something like this. Okay, so just to have to put the power of two here. And uh, maybe another one. And here you see, now again, I'm not saying you will figure out the exact function. That's not the task here, guys. That's literally not the task. The task is to approximate it as well as possible with the margin of error. And if you can do it well, if we can do it well, our prediction starts to work. And the hope is this continues on in our favor. And in this very simple example, I just have tried to show you how programming can be utilized to code up all these mathematics that is behind machine learning. And yes, programming will be required. It will not be that straightforward. Okay. Now the good news is not everything has to be done by you. That's the good news. Not everything has to be done by you. For Python, uh, for particularly for machine learning programming, it uh, Python has something called scikit-learn, okay, or we like to call it sklearn, okay. This contains almost all the major algorithms around classification, regression, clustering, feature selection, okay, almost all the major ones that would be required, like model selection, dimension reduction, pre-processing of data. So the good news is we don't have to do all of this all by ourselves, or we don't have to write every code by ourselves. And this is what we are inherently at the end of the day teach here as well, that how to do these things. So let's say if you wanted to do some kind of a simple regression, uh, ordinary least squares can be utilized for this purpose. And you will see the very similar idea, what I'm trying to tell you here. But here we will, will be able to implement the same thing maybe within four or five lines of code rather than writing all that code. But this kind of code kind of gives you an intuition. So maybe I can show you just one more example before we can open it up for discussions for everyone, okay? One moment, guys. And uh, what I could do here is, or the way I could work here is, I could upload a small data set on Colab as well, and I will try to show you. Uh, the good news is this data set is on my Google Drive, so it would be a little easy for me to run this. So this is your simple uh, experience versus salary data. I will I will show you what this data is. Okay. So it is gonna ask some connectivity to my Google Drive, which I will do right away. And once it is connected, I will be able to utilize this in my favor. Okay, so basically this file is already available on my Google Drive. And I just need to know how to use to utilize it. That's it. So once it is connected, I can load this file directly on my Google Colab. And then on Google Colab, I will be able to segregate. So guys, this is how the data looks like. Okay, so you have your salary data where you have years of experience versus the salary. So guys, understand this is your input feature if you want to say it like this. So this will remain your input feature. Here we have our input feature and here we have our salary. Okay, so based on these data instances, now we have to figure out or we have to come up with this idea or a model, better, better word is a model definitely, okay. We will have to come up with a model which could solve our problem. Okay, all together. Hmm. Now, good news is we do not have to do everything by hand as I kind of tried to do earlier. And again, kind of figuring out correlation uh, is really easy here in Python. And again, one could run the Pearson R test. And here I'm just gonna separate my data set. And now good news is the whole linear regression that I had to write all of that massive amount of code can be like fit in within three, four lines. 
that you call the function, then you fit the fit model. Fit is basically running the training process. And then once you are done, you can start making predictions on the new data, x -test data, which it has never seen. And then these predictions can be utilized to calculate the scoring. And even we can get our predictions done properly. And this model can return you the coefficients and intercept very well. OK, and based on the coefficients and intercept, I could draw up the line, or at least in 2D, we can do all this. So guys, what do you, what did you just understand from this example? So the idea is if you use some package, it becomes a little easier to run the code. It becomes fairly straightforward and they help you in faster analysis and implementation. Okay. So this is this is the part of your data science course at the end of the day. And I know like uh, right now I cannot spend too much time explaining every small thing, how everything works here. But this is the intuition and this is the knowledge that you get if you join or uh, if you join our data science courses at Learn Bay. And as I told you yesterday, that if anyone is interested in learning courses, they should definitely have a look around all this and maybe talk to our counselors and maybe even uh, apply or get at least do your inquiry as early as possible. And this was just a small demo. Okay, I cannot uh, stress that how complicated and how big demos we can also have. But right now, we uh, I'm just giving you a small demo here just to explain you that how easily we can do all these things once we know the right tools and the way to program all these ideas. Okay. Okay, guys, so this is what was simple pattern recognition and kind of I showed you a small linear regression example here to showcase how this will work in our favor. Okay, so guys, uh, if you have any questions, now you guys can um, go ahead and ask me, okay? Now, a few, few suggestions to you guys. Okay, understand that data science is still a mathematical heavy course. So a decent knowledge of linear algebra, probability, calculus will definitely help you in this, and statistics, I forgot about that. So a decent background, or even if you have not have a background, a decent study in these fields will help you understanding these core concepts around machine learning, because you saw that I basically applied gradient and that was basically your calculus, right, at the end of the day. So all of that will really, really help you out in this process if you want to become. Michaela, so basically underfitting and overfitting, we have to compare the bias and variance. So uh, we will ideally one could do a simple experiment where we could try to figure out uh, what is the gap between the training and testing data, okay, uh, performance between uh, our model. And usually if a model is underperforming with some new data or validation data, that is a very clear cut sign that you have overfitted. Underfitting scenario, usually your training and testing performance, both are really bad. Okay. There are different ways to do a cross-validation, uh, but right now I cannot go into all this immediately. But yeah, there are processes in machine learning and there are functions in SKLearn, which we could implement and which could get us these results. Okay. Okay, guys, go ahead. Any other problem? Any other question or any other thing that you want to know? You can type in the chat, I will read it out, okay? Oh, SKLearn can do practically anything that you want in machine learning. Okay. You can do almost any kind of regression, data cleaning, uh, classification, clustering, 
uh, model evaluation, uh, even some neural network models could be run through SKLearn. So SKLearn is a very useful library right now, and it will pay off for you guys to learn SKLearn and practice uh, your code and machine learning examples via SKLearn. If you're gonna stay in the Python environment, then SKLearn is something that you have to get familiar with. Okay. Yeah, Abraham, uh, so, okay, everyone's path is gonna be different, but I will say that you start with learning programming. If you already know this, then you should focus on statistics and machine learning first, okay? If you already know programming. Uh, if you want some good paths, then definitely talk to Learn Bay counseling team. They actually, they are better people to guide you. Based on your profile, they will be able to tell you what you should do and how you should proceed and move forward in this field. I can only give a general advice without knowing your full profile is very hard for me to give a specific advice. But I think learning programming, learning mathematics will definitely help you in data science and machine learning. So that is where you can start. Okay. Yeah, yeah, de definitely done. It is, it is a still very large. It's not gonna be finished in two hours or even six hours. People can spend 60 to 80 hours. Still, there would be so many things left to learn. And this is how learning goes. I'm still learning deep learning. I'm still learning machine learning. Every couple of months, we see some new algorithm come up and we again have to start learning them, okay? So there is a lot of learning going on here and uh, if you're excited about this, then definitely I would ask you guys to step deeper here and like put some serious effort, maybe nine months, 12 months time and try to learn this field with a little bit more depth and uh, programming and mathematics, statistics and uh, machine learning, deep learning. Then you will really see the depths of this field and how deep things can go in. But it's really interesting. I am fascinated every day. I'm fascinated with the field of AI and the progress that we are making here. Okay, any other question? Okay, uh, so apart from accuracy, you should ideally look into, now if it's a classification, then you need to look into ROC, UC curve. You should also look into F1 score, classification reports. Uh, you should also try to delete some data or like remove, randomly remove some data and see, does the model's performance suffer? Try to test it with some real-time data and see how good your model is. So you have to swap the model uh, with, uh, sorry, you have to swap the data and try it with different data sets or, or at least different versions of the same data and see is the model consistent. So apart from accuracy, I will say consistency is the one thing I would like to look. See, if there is a model which is 90% accurate, but one there is an, but it is highly inconsistent, okay? And the other model is 82% accurate, but highly consistent. And most of the days I'm gonna go for 82% accuracy model because it's a consistent model. So I would like you guys to think about or think in those terms only. Okay, guys, that's all from my side. So we have Karishma from LearnBay. She would want to have a word with you. Please listen to her. And uh, uh, I'm at my end of the session, but I will just give you this advice that uh, if you truly want to take a deeper dive in machine learning, there is no better time than this. Get started as early as possible because this is gonna be a long journey. So I wish you all the best and I hope you get to learn and have a lot of fun while learning machine learning. All right. All right, guys. Uh, so I'll be taking off. Karishma, are you there?
Yes, sir. Okay, Kashma, please take over. Um, I will be dropping out now. Okay. Sure, sir. Thank you, guys. Take care. You guys have a great day. Okay. Thank you, sir. Bye, guys. Take care.